And we're live. Welcome, What's guys. What's up, everybody? This is, yeah, Vanguard live stream part two. We just got done uh, chatting with uh, Christine Olivo, congressional candidate for Florida's 24th, and just a super awesome lady, one of our favorite guests yeah. uh, to just shoot the shit with. She was awesome. Uh, we, this was our second time speaking with her on the show. Uh, so for anybody who's curious with, about that, I'll go check that out. But without further ado, this time we're going to correctly shout out our patrons, as we always do before, as a thank you for helping us support the show. Uh, Gavin. Yeah, thanks so much to the patrons, guys. You can join by clicking the link in the description or going to the uh, patreon.com slash the Vanguard channel. Uh, yeah, really uh, big help, guys. Support the show, independent media. We really do appreciate that. And and yeah, like you said, Zach, um, if anyone's just checking this out or is new to the channel or isn't new to the channel, make sure to um, go watch that interview we just did with Christine Olivo, who's just recently announced her candidacy once again. She's running for the 24th District. And shout out Florida. to Josh Krulik, who's not featured on the Patreon board, but I just got a notification that you are a new patron. So congratulations. Uh, thank you for joining. Yeah. yeah. And if this is, uh, you know, if you're tuning in again, um, welcome to the stream. A uh, little bit impromptu today. I'm in Florida on vacation. So my um, fuck around and find out flag is not behind me. And I have this fucking shitty margarita from the hotel bar that I'm sipping on. So having fun today uh, doing this live stream. Decided to bring you guys some news again, despite the fact that I am not at my usual uh, abode. But Gavin needs to get one of those cigarette holders and some yellow glasses. He's going to do the HST for the evening. <laughs> exactly. um, yeah, but uh, we actually had some serious stories that we wanted to uh, get to, which is why we wanted to do uh, one of these sort of impromptu live streams while Gavin uh, is out of town. And uh, really, it's just to talk about how, uh, once again, you know, like we always talk about on this show, working people got fucked completely by uh, Congress. Um, and this, uh, you know, qu quasi-stimulus bill that just got voted on, it's it, um, essentially going to give 600 bucks to, you know, starving Americans as a quote-unquote stimulus. Uh, Gavin, what's your initial reaction to the $600? Got it. It's just, it's so insulting. And again, it's like we got 1,200 or 1,000 or 1,200. I forget. Uh, I mean, I didn't because I'm technically a dependent still, but a lot of the, the first round was even more than this. And that's when the pandemic wasn't even nearly as bad. It's, it's, it's crazy to think that how much worse the pandemic is now and how much less seriously it's been taken. I mean, not only is this, you know, pittance just pitiful, but also people aren't receiving hazard pay anymore. There's no uh, continued uh, you know, recognition of the sacrifice that, you know, frontline workers, the sacrificial class of fucking human beings in this country is currently being subjected to uh, just to feed their families. And, you know, like we were just talking about with Christine, hopefully, you know, afford some fucking Christmas gifts for their children. So this is just disgraceful. Yeah. And it's and, and uh, this Daily Poster piece, you know, really lays it out. And one of the things just for a little bit of context and, and you know, this is what David Sirota is really fantastic at. In my view, is he takes this like really like abstract complicated bill that hardly anybody's had time to you know look at and, and one of the things that he said uh that just really puts it into perspective as a working person is according to the bill summary circulating on capitol hill the legislation provides a mere 286 billion dollars for survival checks and unemployment benefits right so that's anything that a working person would actually need right so 28 or 286 billion dollars right and an additional 51 billion dollars for food aid and rental assistance. Okay, so that's essentially nothing, right? That's a total pittance. Uh, it's way less than what Steve Mnuchin offered with Donald Trump that Nancy Pelosi deemed completely unacceptable. Uh, we talked about this a few days back. Uh, it's horseshit. Uh, and he says, it's obviously inadequate. And for comparison, only three years ago, Republicans passed a $1.5 trillion tax cut that enriched the wealthiest 1%. So he's obviously referencing Donald Trump's infamous tax bill, um, right, which was voted for uh, by, you know, uh, interestingly enough, Joshua Hawley, who found himself on the other side of this, uh, you know, populist crusade this time around. Um, and it even the Democrats couldn't even get enough to basically get the taxes back, right? Like they could like with what they'd already spent on on cutting the tax uh, with cutting the taxes of the trillionaire, they couldn't even just decide, okay, you know what, let's roll back that in, in, in or it's equivalent from some other source and give people at least $1.5 trillion in the midst of the greatest economic depression since literally the great depression and uh, which obviously happened in 1929. So almost a hundred years ago, uh, it's fucking pathetic, but you know, I, I, I think the, the, 
deeper conversation comes down to this because this kind of horseshit was going to happen with the Democrats, um, you know, pretty much regardless, right? We knew Joe Biden. I mean, where was Joe Biden in all this, right? Like that's the, the quiet Joe Biden. Joe Biden didn't make a single push for $1,200. Like where is the outrage about the fact that Joe Biden has been completely fucking absent in this entire discussion? There's no commentary on it. People were always like, where's Donald Trump? It, well, guess what? Joe Biden is the president-elect right now. He arguably has more pull with Congress than Donald Trump does because he's about to be assuming power in a month. Okay, you, you don't think that if he was have, heavily leaning into $1,200 that he could have had some pull, that he could have made some deals? Of course not. He didn't give a fuck. He didn't want to expend any of his leverage because he's a king of austerity, and that's exactly what we should expect. Uh, what I do think is a more interesting argument and what I was really excited to get your kind of take on is um, – you know, uh, our, our favorite love hate relationship, our, our toxic, the toxic, the most toxic relationship on the left. Tulsi Gabbard said, fuck this. I'm not voting for it. Uh, along with, uh, you know, Rashida Tlaib, who obviously is, uh, you know, a more palatable candidate in Congress. But, you know, this is one of those times where I feel like, fuck Tulsi, like I just shit on you so hard last week because you were being dumb as rocks, pushing that anti-trans bigotry, you know, it, for, so the high school trans kids can't play field hockey. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? But you're really right right now when you say that $600 is a fucking pittance and it's a disgrace and that also we're not going to sign off on you raiding uh, the American people for all these other, you know, horseshit loopholes that you're putting into this bill that's 5,000 pages long that nobody had any time to read. Yeah, it's really weird. Tulsi Gabbard, I mean, obviously she does come out in favor of the right things a lot of the times, and, and we always give her credit for that. You know, uh, any member of Congress that wants to stand up to this is more than happy to, you know, receive credit from us. We give credit to Josh Hawley, uh, who, of course, worked with Bernie Sanders to try to get uh, Americans, you know, real stimulus. And, and here it even says, you know, back in March, Republican Senator Tom Cotton proposed giving uh, low income and middle income Americans between $1,000 and $4,000 of aid per month. Obviously, that never happened. Uh, and then, you know, Donald Trump was reportedly talking about how he wanted more money. So it's like, this isn't, uh, this it's not like this is an unpopular thing. This is a very bipartisan consensus. Um, it's just ridiculous that no one was actually able to kind of strong man this into happening. Of course, obviously, the real blame falls at the, you know, behest of the president, um, who is still the president right now. And, uh, you know, if you really want to do anything in your last, um, you know, month or whatever in office, this would be a really great way to solidify any kind of a fucking legacy of any sort. Uh, I mean, getting people money, especially right before Christmas, that's definitely uh, about the most popular shit you could possibly have done. Honestly, it would have been the one way that Donald Trump could have won this re-election pretty handily if he had just done this a while ago. And obviously you have to work through the Senate. I believe it was um, Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson that twice blocked um, the stimulus from the Cotton, or the Holly Bernie bill. Um, yeah. So, you know, fuck ron johnson probably one of the biggest villains of recent memory yeah, he's one of those like last remaining like true deficit hawk yeah. in his bones like you would rather watch people starve on yeah. the street than the most, you know do anything but give yeah. handouts to billionaires i mean he's like real mitch mcconnell ideologue he's, sociopath who is another great villain of this but even he was willing i mean the democrats had the chips in their hands right with like he knew that this Senate race in the majority, which he desperately wanted, he desperately wanted to hold on to the Senate majority that gave the Democrats power because people in Georgia were, they, I mean, the Democrats were hammering the Republicans on not having stimulus and being able to blame Mitch McConnell for this. Now they can't do that anymore because they sold out for 600 lousy fucking dollars. Are you kidding me? And you know, um, just to go back quickly to the Sirota piece, you don't have to put it back up, but he made the point that regardless of whether or not it was all fiction and a hoax with the Republicans like Tom Cotton, who were, you know, saying, oh, we need to give stimulus, you know, $2,000 a month, you know, oh, maybe Donald Trump was full of shit. Maybe Steve Mnuchin's initial offer, which was, you know, vastly more, uh, you know, I don't want to call it more generous. It was less stingy than this one yeah. by a large amount. Um, that obviously didn't pass. You could say that you know the, the, that the Republicans were bluffing, but as David Sirota points out, that point's completely mute, right? It, it, it doesn't matter. The Democrats did nothing. They they gave they gave Mark Warner and uh, what's his fuck? Um, who was the other guy? That, Manchin, Joe Manchin, I think yeah. was the other guy that was negotiating, right? Uh, they gave uh, two of the basically Republicans, right? Two of the most easily identified of identifiable dinos in the fucking democratic party. Um, it, they were the ones that were going to go advocate for the working people. Are you fucking kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? No wonder this is what happened. You got a, you got uh, an, an extreely conservative Republican, you know, um, 
it basically just a spit in the eye of anybody who was hoping to get any kind of relief. You and I are cynics, right? Or realists, depending on how you describe it, right? We weren't expecting adequate relief. Uh, but it almost feels like, I mean, and you don't want to be like nothing at all would have been better, but you, you shouldn't have been able, you, you should, I, I agree that they made the right decision in rejecting the bill because you can't accept this. You have to continue to hammer them and demand more. And when you give them a bill like this, it's basically just acquiescing in my view. Yeah. And again, shout out to Tulsi and to Rashida because, um, you know, despite anything else, uh, despite any other preconceived notions we might have about any candidates, you know, again, you're more than happy to, or we're more than happy to give you credit on this show if you actually stand up to this bullshit and, you know, vote on the side of the people, which is absolutely what I would have done. This is absolute horseshit. Uh, you know, again, another upward transfer of wealth with crumbs for the, you know, peasant class essentially. And again, here it says, uh, Pelosi insisted at a press conference on Sunday that when it comes time to further spending bills, we're going to have a much easier time than we've had uh, with the Republican Senate and a Republican president. Well, it's like, all right. She's basically yeah. like, and I think he does point out that this would only be the case if they win both fucking races in Georgia. She's basically acting as if that's in the bag. And let's be very clear: it will be a surprise victory if both of those come up. Like, I think you're, you're like, yes, it's probably going to happen that one of those elections will go the Democrats' way. Uh, probably Warnock, I think, will go the Democrats' way. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's my guess. But like I said, I don't believe in polls anymore. So I'm like, I don't fucking know how to make any of these calculations after the last uh, election cycle. So I'm just like, we'll see. We'll find out. We'll see what the people of Georgia do. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I do think that, again, as we've talked about in the show, the, the Republicans uh, really shot themselves in the foot by having two of the worst, most corrupt, uh, oh, you know, more God, yes. uncharismatic politicians in Kelly Loeffler and uh, David Perdue and obviously uh, like self-serving. Yeah. Yeah. So th they really just epitomize the kind of like elitist, um, Republican, you know, the real Republican, unlike, you know, the faux populist that we talk about all the time. Those are the real, uh, really represent the donor class of the Republican party and the actual financial interests of that party. And What's Kelly Loeffler's net worth again? Oh, she's the richest member of uh, the entire Congress, Senate and Congress. I think she has like nine houses, like 70 million. $500 million or something oh, astronomical, I yeah. think. It's like fucking <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, she's in, She's like, they're both a caricature, honestly, of, you know, Republican corruption and, you know, self-serving politicians. And it's crazy. And again, they neither of them have any charisma. They're both terrible <laughs> fucking candidates. Uh, if they win, it'll basically just because be, because people check the generic Republican option, you know, without doing their homework, without having watched any of the debates. Because in my opinion, regardless of, you know, if you're a more conservative leaning person or not, the choice is so obvious just from a character perspective. I mean, especially in the Warnock race, you know, John Ossoff's a bit of a, you know, shithead. But I do uh, think that Reverend Warnock has really rooted, you know, he, he has some really good speeches from back in the day where he was railing against the GOP and stuff. And, you know, the, or not just the GOP, but, you know, politicians in general that are selling out the working class. He's got charisma, he, which is why I think he has yeah. a better chance of winning. I just think John Ossoff is so boring. He's such a generic fucking guy. Like, uh, you see the Democratic Party. The, the Democratic Party loves those types, though. You know, I know, but I hate them, and I think so does everybody else. Like, yeah, it's so true. They're like the kind of candidates that are like cooked up in the Democratic lab. Is like, oh, this is the perfect candidate, and then they fail every time. Beto, Pete, you know, all these like fucking milk toast like people that try to sound, like all these white guys trying to sound like Obama. You know what I'm saying? Trying to be super like inspiring and verbose and That'd all this shit. Yeah, I have a vision for the future of America. Follow me. <laughs> exactly. It honestly reminds you of how it reminds you of how talented Obama was when you actually. Dude, yeah, yeah, we talk about that a lot on this show. Yeah. Kind of how fuck, damn, he was good. You know, um, yeah. I did want to ask you, uh, Gavin. Josh Cave brings up a good point in the comment section. Do you think it's fair to say that AOC isn't a sellout to corporations, but she's a sellout to the establishment? He asks. He thinks she's spineless. Um, I have a take on this, Gavin. Do you want to go first? Whew, that's tough. Uh, I mean, I feel like I'd have to like sit down with AOC to really discern that. But as of now, I would say, yeah, she's a seller to the establishment. I don't think she's taking money from pharma or whatever. I don't think she was representing the interests of this of the corporate America necessarily. But I do think she's just too afraid and, and doesn't quite have the balls to, uh, you know, really attack her own party to really attack the establishment beyond just a, a tweet, you know, every now and then and some grandstanding essentially. But uh, I do think she's, you know, I, I want to say she's spineless, but I, I would say she's uh, you know, she, she's let us down. 
Yeah, I think that uh, AOC has really bad strategy. I think that her strategy has been proven time and time again to be bad, right? Like she was sitting, like her whole grand plan was to get this committee appointment. And that's why, that's why she told everybody, like really she didn't have a fucking plan and she didn't want to piss off Nancy Pelosi and ruin her chance at ever really like gr- climbing the ladder of Congress. I think that AOC sees a lot of opportunity for herself. And I think to be fair, after spending a lot of, look, this is a country that, that in, in Congress, and you have to understand that she's working in a system that she's spending all of her time completely steeped in, and it's a swamp. And what it does is it, it, it basically tells you that if you can climb, you can help your constituents more. So what she's doing is she's running on a fucking hamster wheel, exhausting herself, working within a system that's fucking broken. It's designed to exhaust her, get her to accomplish nothing, and get booted the fuck out. Okay? And that's how the cycle continues. And we've proven the fact that she just doesn't have great strategy, right? Like, I don't, do I have to bring up the fact that she didn't fucking endorse Cori Bush? Probably one of the most obvious congressional choices. And it's because she didn't think that Cori was going to win, like a lot of people. However, instead of making the courageous and moral move of saying, you know what, I'm going to stand by somebody who, one, I had previously endorsed, two, was in the same fucking documentary that made me as popular as I am today, you know, and, and somebody that I refer to as a friend after they got elected, even though I didn't endorse them, which was fake as shit. Um, you know, doing all these kinds of things, I think it's just because, you know, eventually over time through osmosis, you become what's the water that you're steeping in, right? Like in the same way a fish asks, what is water? A politician asks, what is corruption, right? You can't always see it anymore. And the fact of the matter is, is AOC went to Congress an activist, Sandy the bartender, and she came back a politician. She's a politician now. She supports the right things on paper, but her strategy is fucked. And she needs to have activist communities remind her that she's there to be a, 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 a voice in a, in a, in a and a presence for the activist community in Congress and not somebody that's strategically aligned with the Democratic Party who is who she came there to set on fire, basically. Yeah, a party that she even admitted was not to the left. And, and again, I, I will remind everyone again, um, during the primaries, AOC said, it's a shame, it's a disgrace that I have to be part of the same party that Joe Biden yeah. is. Again, like that was before, you'd be in a that different was before he actually seemed like he was going to win. It still seemed like he was just this embarrassing, you know, like, feeble old man at that point that had no actual chance so uh, she would never say something like that now now that he's the person to please uh and again i'm not we're not trying to talk shit on aoc i, I think she's obviously so much no better. but you have to hold her to account she did b- yeah. vote for this horse shit and, and so did probably- Ilhan omar man like, yeah i know it's Ilhan really omar's official take was saying like oh i you know i know i would rather have six hundred dollars than nothing and i hear that I do, but I think the over well, uh, and maybe it's an echo chamber. So you know, you, you know, people could you know say otherwise. I, I think uh, I think that I think we I think that it's all fucked that we ended up in this place. Uh, I, I I think I, I don't well, know. With I, Ilhan Omar, it annoys me. It's like if you're gonna vote for it, you at least have to like resist hardcore. Again, go on social media. Go on exactly. Uh, yeah, that all it didn't call out sure. the establishment. Call out these people. If you're gonna go along with them in the first place, you have to at least identify the problem and call it out so people know. That you're not just enabling this, you know, bullshit. Like you have to at least fight for the people in some stance. And I and I agree. Her take was really underwhelming. And I've been a huge fan of Ilhan. I think she's, you know, been at some points better than AOC on certain issues. So that was just super disappointing to see. And again, it's always, uh, you know, it's just like it's just like what the hell, guys? This is not why you were elected. This is not your tenor a year or two ago. And um, it reminds me of something that Jen Perlman said, who um, you know, is one of our favorite candidates. And, you know, we talked to her a while ago. She said, uh, you know, if I was if I'm get elected, I'm not going to I'm not going to be there to stay around. You know, I don't want to make friends here. I'm going to serve a term or two and then, you know, get the fuck out. She be- someone that believes in term limits who I go back and forth on the concept of term limits. But I think it's a I think it's at least a valid or, you know, worth acknowledging the you know, what Jim I mean, Perlman said. Running every two years, I think there's more there's less of an argument for term limits than if you're getting a Senate run, which is like a six year position. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. But still, I think it's a I think it's a. It's underrepresented uh, or it's under acknowledged the fact that you don't have to be a career politician. You can literally just go there to serve your community and get what needs to be done. You don't have to, you know, be this like uh, career politician that just, like you said, soaks in the corruption, uh, osmosis. It just, you, you're so, when you're in that world, when you're lying, whining and dining with uh, your fellow congressional members and the elite class and all these, uh, you know, you're getting treated to these media interviews and stuff. You really do easily adopt that mindset, and it's hard. It's easy to, uh, you know, just forget the actual struggle out there and how bad it is. And it just, uh, if I was in Congress, you know, it would be obvious for me. I would never vote for Nancy Pelosi. I would, you know, it would be my pleasure to go on cable news and talk shit on the Democratic leadership if they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And I, I just think it's disappointing now that Biden has won. 
Um, I, I guess they're waiting for the Georgia Senate. They're always waiting for something. To they're always, open, it's so. always a carrot on a stick, man. That's the thing. And that's, I mean, to be honest, that's, I think at, at, at some point, it, you know, for everybody on the left that really is serious about this shit, it, at some point it, the rubber hits the road and you're like, oh gosh, this is a game that we're playing where it's always, it's, you know, it's like next election is going to be the most important election of your fucking life. Fuck Donald Trump now, dude. This is an actual competent fascist. Okay. Do you understand, Gavin? Do you fucking understand, Gavin, that this is this is somebody who's going to actually be able to competently run this country like a fascist now? You, we need Kamala Harris. We need somebody that's already been into office. What is wrong with you? You piece of shit. You think- do you think they're gonna? Um, do you think Biden's gonna step down in like 2023 and let Kamala take over so to try to avoid a primary situation? I don't think so, but that's interesting. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna rule it out, but I, would I put money on it now? Because because think about it, if, if Biden stepped, and obviously this is all speculation, guys. No, sure. you know this is not newsworthy. But um, if, if Kamala or if Biden were to step down in 2023 because of you know his dementia or whatever the fuck, and then Kamala becomes the first female president, number 46. And there's this big, huge thing. The Democratic Party makes a big show of it. It's going to make it a lot harder for other people to challenge the first female president in the 2024 primary. Yeah, I just don't think Joe would go along with it. I think he has too big of an ego. That's very possible. That is very possible. And it, I think it, it, it undermines him. I think if he's already going to be a one-term president, he wants to have the full term. I mean, these people think about being in the history books. He's already spent so much time with Barack Obama, who's a historical president. He spent so much time in the shadow. I mean, I'm just trying to think about it from Joe Biden's like, you know, perspective. I just think one, he's, I mean, if you listen to the guy, I mean, we talked about it briefly again in the Christine Olivo interview. We talked about it uh, in the past, uh, with Ashley, uh, the, the audio leak, um, you know, the, just the way that he demeaned and, 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 and talked down to those, uh, civil rights leaders, you know, he, he definitely took, he just took on this aura of a narcissistic, like kind of disgusting power holder. Like, so I'm the president, I'm the president. What I say matters. What I say, like, just shut the fuck up. You don't do anything and no, you don't matter. But yeah. like it, you know what I mean? It's like I, I just, in his mind, he's not going to do it. Yeah, he was also super coherent in those clips. Like he actually, he didn't sound like someone that had Alzheimer's in those clips. He sounded like someone that knew what the fuck he was talking about, which is so funny that the only time he does is when he's you know shitting on civil rights leaders in the left of his own party. But uh, yeah, that would that would clue me in that he might he might finish it out too because again, he did come off as a lot more mentally there. Uh, than when he was, you know, trying to defend some of the policies that he doesn't actually support. That like a tactic for sympathy in the primary because it might have been genius. This like, uh, like this like love affable geriatric charm. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it made him immune to a lot of attacks because even when Julian Castro tried to attack him, he got shamed by the media and they they called him ageist. Yeah, they called him ageist because he were like he he pointed out he's like, do you not remember what you just fucking said? And they were like. They're like, no, 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 naughty, naughty, naughty boy. And like, and no one touched him again after that. Yeah, I remember Cory Booker was all like, I don't, I think we're all a little worried that Joe has what it takes to get this football across the, the fucking touchdown line or whatever the fuck he said. It was like a clunky metaphor. Speaking uh, of football metaphors, everyone go check out uh, Zach's recent piece on the Vanguard blog where he discusses um, a very similar thing about the, the, the Charlie Brown football. Do you want to talk about that at all? Oh yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's one of those things that we kind of go back and forth on. We don't, we're not really sure if anybody gives a shit about the pieces that we publish. Uh, but we did, we have started to do a, a like a segment, I guess, or I, I guess I kind of came up with, uh, this little topic for blog posts called the liberal head fake. Essentially what it is, is it's going to be diving into all the things where, you know, the democratic party uh, establishment pedals one line and then overnight everybody switches the narrative. So the one that I pull out for this first edition, uh, I, I highlight uh, the reporting of a certain uh, Vox founder, Matt Iglesias, who I always just have a little bit of a personal bone to pick with uh, because he, he pretended to be like this, like moonlight progressive insight for a while. And then when Bernie Sanders ran his campaign, he turned fucking sides and anyway, uh, it's really obvious, and you can read all of his flip-flopping reporting. An example, he's one of the many people who set up Biden as having like one of the most pro- um, progressive platforms um, of all time, perhaps as a Democratic nominee. And then, you know, m- days, weeks after the election, is on shows like Rising, being like, Joe Biden never promised to be anything other than like an austere, you know. Uh, yeah. school governor and then like write this piece writes this piece in uh the washington post that's like oh, joe biden never promised to do anything progressive and that's why he won and like you know all yeah. this kind of horseshit anyway there's you can read the piece if you want to read his quotes and you know fact check what i just told you but we can put a link in the description if this gets re-uploaded I think it is. 
I think it is right oh, now. Right. The, yeah, the link to the Vanguard.blog, where again you can read Zach's latest piece as well as our back catalog of pieces, which are you know pretty decent. I think we stand by our work. So yeah, and one of the things that I did want to uh, talk to you uh, about, I think it would be a good idea if uh, we'll do a, a little bit of a Vanguard re year in review one of these times on a live stream and kind of uh, yeah. kind of go back through the catalog and basically let everybody know that we did a fuck ton of just like straight up writing news writing on our blog um before we ever did any kind of interviewing or um you know that kind of thing so yeah if anybody's curious about that you can always check that out that's on there um yeah. another story yeah. i did want to talk about that we um pulled and obviously we like to talk about the people's party a lot here and yeah. that would be um some new additions to their advisory council obviously the 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 very popular and uh famous dr cornell west uh, bernie sanders surrogate and also Jimmy Dore, the, you know, the controversial comedian who we've talked so much about recently, who's, of course, recently been pressuring, um, you know, the squad to vote no on Pelosi. So this is definitely an interesting. Uh, it, it's cool that the People's Party, in my opinion, at least, is really tying itself to this force the vote strategy, because I think there's just so much promise to that. And it's a really great idea. Um, it, I think it's awesome, too, that, you know, Dr. Cornell West, the great Dr. Cornell West is is really lending his credence and credibility to this organization because he's definitely, you know, stepping out on a limb here. He's definitely taking some ridicule, taking some shit for associating himself with the likes of Jimmy Dore and this third party um, quest, which so many people just view as doomed to begin with. So I think it's awesome. And, you know, props to the great Dr. Cornell West is just so inspiring, so articulate, one of the best thinkers of our time on these issues. Uh, I really do applaud him for, you know, taking that step to join their uh, advisory committee. Obviously, he was also a speaker at the convention. So I just think it's really important and props to him, like I said. Yeah, dude. I mean, obviously, anytime you have Cornell West, Dr. Cornell West doing something, it adds, like you said, credence and authority to the movement. And and it also kind of adds a, a certain moral sign off, right? Uh, for me, anybody who comes at me with a you know, the sideways logic of they don't like Jimmy Dore's fucking behavior. They want to police his fucking, you know, uh, it, you know, to me that registers as the same kind of shit. It's like when we get a comment, it's like, say fuck less on your podcast. I'm like, just listen to a different podcast. Like, you know, it's like, sorry, like I've never, you know, and, and, and you know, I get that, you know, oh, you think Jimmy Dore is rude. Great. Like listen to a different fucking YouTube show. Like, like who cares if you, like you think he's rude. It's like, I mean, you know, it's like he's not hateful. I, I mean, I don't, you know, I think he's, 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 you know, correctly pissed off and sure he's made questionable calls. And like when he said that, you know, Donald Trump was going to be better for the country than Hillary Clinton. I don't know if that ended up being true or, you know, all kinds of things like that. that you Tulsi over and over again. Yeah. 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 Sure. But, but what I'm saying is, is it just as you can challenge that, like Dr. Cornell West provides that that counterweight of, of absolute moral clarity, moral authority. I mean, this dude is deeply rooted in, um, you know, uh, uh, what black liberation theology, the civil rights movement. Um, you know, I mean, I, I just think time and time again, he's always been on the right side, right? And he's always, always on the vanguard of those right ideas, right? He's always there first. He's always there supporting Bernie Sanders. He's always there on the picket line where he, you know, and, and I think that says everything about this. And I think that the range that the range of reach that you have when you have Cornell West on one side of the edition and Jimmy Dore on the other, I think that is, that's movement building. That's reaching with your arms open this way and saying, I'm trying to corral everybody who wants healthcare as a human right. I'm trying to corral everybody who wants to make sure that nobody's homeless. I'm trying to corral everybody that means that, hey, we need real stimulus, not $600 fucking dollars. Are you kidding me? I want to know who's going to demand a vote on the floor and stop playing these fucking games about, oh, I support Medicare for all, when you fucking don't. You know what I mean? I, I think that's, I think that's, um, that's effective. Yeah, hundred percent. And again, he's a you know public intellectual, Harvard professor. So it can't be understated how you know influential West is. And obviously, he wrote with a wonder kid too. I'm pretty sure he graduated Harvard when he was like 19 years yeah. old or something crazy. Yeah, and uh, you know it just can't be understated. Again, I feel like his um, he's a real force. Uh, even like even people on the you know more liberal side of things, people that might have supported someone else in the primary that wasn't Bernie. I don't think anyone can deny, uh, like you said, the moral authority. Uh, just the 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 magnitude of Dr. Cornell West's contribution to thinking and and like you said, black liberation. So this is so awesome, and and I can't wait to see what happens here. I hope that uh, you know Cornell West is out there fighting for this and trying to get this off the ground. And again, you know, despite the fact that we have disagreed with Jimmy Dore in the past, I think he's uh, you know just a 
so outspoken and, and like you said he he's angry and th there's a reason to be angry you know and that's why he's resonating right now so much that's why his streams on youtube are getting you know incredibly high amounts of uh people tuning in now he's like he's he's really you know forming uh, a movement around this force the vote thing and again for the millionth time for the millionth fucking caveat we don't have to agree with everything the man says to sign off on this idea to agree that this is obviously the correct way uh, or at least one correct option um, to, you know, get this done to make a floor vote on Medicare for hap uh, for all to happen to pressure. I'm still waiting for a better fucking idea if somebody's got one. So, and before we leave for this, uh, or not leave, but like move on from talking about healthcare, uh, I did see uh, one more fucking just kicking the fucking balls for everybody uh, that I wanted to get to. Uh, COVID nineteen relief bill doubles the healthcare budget for Congress. So. Uh, if we can just get that pulled up, great reporting by uh, Lee Fong at The Intercept. Uh, always does great, excellent reporting um, uh, uh, on The Intercept. Uh, and essentially, uh, let's see, let me get this pulled up so I can actually read from it. Because I can't see that. But yeah, it, essentially it went from like just under $5 million uh, for the entire budget. So for anybody who's not familiar with all the, the privileges of being in uh, Congress and the Senate, they take care of each other. They scratch each other's backs, if you will. You know, in the same way they like to vote for each other's raises. They like to vote for other shit that makes their life easier. This time it's fucking doubling the budget for their health care to go to like the pharmacy. They, they have a special pharmacist that you can go to if you're in the House or the Senate, special chiropractors, nurses, you know, uh, the things that you would really need if you were in a pandemic and you were a human being, except they only, you know, uh, want to guarantee that for themselves, you know, that not the plebeians b beneath them. Uh, but anyway, that current spending, the Office of Attending Physician, as it's referred to, is currently around $4.27 million. Lee Fong points out that they're adding an additional $5 million injection into that to cover, uh, you know, the testing, the vaccination, um, all these kinds of things. Um, obviously, when they're not providing health care for everybody, they're not guaranteeing uh, equitable uh, distribution of this uh, vaccine uh, in an adequate way. Um, you know, right now, you know, we'll see how the future of the, um, you know, the rollout of the vaccines go uh, and how they're distributed. But uh, for now, I mean, I'm not confident in that. Uh, but yeah. what I am confident in is the fact that Congress is all going to get make sure that they're all vaccinated and not taken care of. Oh, yeah. And, and that's another thing that makes the whole, I think the whole force the vote thing even more insulting. The fact that members of Congress that are supposedly left wing aren't down with this idea. It's like you have health care. Like you have health care. You're good. You're going to be fine. You're, you're doing OK, man. Like you're, it's OK to vote no on Nancy Pelosi in, in order to you know force this conversation to happen on health care, which is so vitally necessary. You're going to be fine. This is outrageous. The people in Congress have so much uh, benefits. They're like the most taken care of people in the entire country. Like you said, they're always going to make sure that their uh, colleagues are doing OK. Uh, because ultimately they are all, you know, in the club, as they say. Yeah, I think that's exactly the thing to remember, right? <laughs> you know, uh, I th we were uh, joking the other day about how uh, the uh, the libertarians uh, reduce everything down to like crony capitalism, but uh, crony politics is uh, a real issue in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, um, I, I did want to break up a little bit of the tension. We've been call we've been talking about a fucking uh, a bunch of bummers, and you know, I just wanted to uh, to, to pull up the worst take of the week. Uh, in my view, this fucking idiot from the New Republic. So I like the New Republic. I, I, I subscribe to them. I get them their print magazine, and you know, uh, far be it for me to challenge a publication for having a wide range of. Uh, opinions in their uh, op-ed section. Uh, this is quite possibly Walter Shapiro, the worst take I've ever read on Joe Biden. It's not, uh, the, there are worse, but uh, this is the worst one of the week. So this guy's arguing that we should give Joe Biden a break. Sure, some of his cabinet choices have been downright puzzling. But what's more important right now is that Joe Biden feels comfortable with the people in his administration. It's kind of like how Donald Trump felt comfortable surrounding himself with his fucking nepotistic circle of family. I couldn't members. fucking help it but, but like be like, what are you talking about? Weren't, wasn't everybody outraged by George Bush and Donald Trump uh, just filling themselves up with people that they're comfortable with? It should be a fucking outrage that Susan Rice is the fucking... Uh, what is it, chief uh, domestic policy advisor or something ridiculous? It should be an outrage that, that uh, the cabinet choices have been basically assigned like they were picked out of a hat of people that Joe Biden likes. 
you know, yeah. like fucking spaghetti thrown against a refrigerator, just whatever sticks. It's fucking ridiculous. I don't know. And this whole piece is just a little smut. Um, like he's basically um, trying to downplay uh, Joe Biden's ability to um, do anything meaningful. Um, and, and, and he's basically just like essentially coming after anybody who is uh, alarmed by Joe Biden's very alarming. Uh, but Zach. But Zach, Pete Buttigieg will be the first openly gay nominee for a cabinet post. Why aren't you more excited about this? Are you oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. The thing is, is that the left just wants to whine. And that's why we're not even talking about that b b before noting that Joe uh, Buttigieg is the ninth uh, and first openly gay nominee in the cabinet. Yep. Fucking great. I, I I forgot about that. We 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 should really uh, we should correct ourselves. But like Tom Vilsack, like what's that guy gonna do for farmers who are devastated by uh, the fucking pandemic, right? Um, yeah, he, he yeah. Yeah, this is a really, really terrible take. And again, I'm also a big fan of the the New Republic. I think uh, you know, if anyone's listening, I, I include it in your media diet. I usually endorse their um, pieces a lot. And, and obviously, this is an opinion. Uh, article so it's not like it's necessarily their official stance or anything but it's still like i wouldn't fucking publish this uh bullshit if i was their editor uh, i think it's really just you know gross and just kind of giving the powerful a pass and it, totally giving corruption a pass like you said or like i said rather um yeah. everyone gave joe biden or donald trump so much shit for surrounding himself with his family uh with a bunch of corrupt insiders and people that had been loyalist to him now Joe Biden, you know, I mean, obviously it's not as grossly nepotistic and, uh, you know, maybe not as obviously disgusting as what we saw with it's Donald Trump. It's just a complete Trump. retread of, of the Obama administration yeah. with a handful of, like, you know, peculiar, yeah. like, Joe Biden loyalists, essentially. And, and, and like you said, some of these picks just don't even make sense. Like, why the fuck is Pete Buttigieg, how in any way is he qualified to be the transportation secretary? Like, why? Like, does he, it's not, because he likes Amtrak and because he said that he proposed to his husband at a you know, the O'Hare airport or some shit like that is not a qualification to be the transportation secretary in a country where our transportation infrastructure is crumbling and gets like a grade of like a fucking F minus or some shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is a country that desperately needs a new transportation infrastructure update that desperately needs, uh, you know, a new a new deal when it comes to our, our monorail system, our broken down train system, like all this shit needs fixing. Uh, we, I mean, obviously, we don't have a monorail yet, but we need one or a high speed rail of some sort. And we need someone with vision, someone with experience, someone that knows what they're fucking doing and that isn't, uh, you know, a McKinsey, ex-McKinsey fucking guy who was a mayor of South Bend. Yeah, for and why is Tom Vilsack getting nominated for AG and then Marsha Fudd gets nominated for HUD when Marsha Fudd should be getting nominated for AG and Tom, and he should, Tom should be getting nominated for fucking nothing? Yeah. Okay? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. It's really disgraceful. So, yeah, fuck that piece. And again, usually we like the New Republic, but that was embarrassing. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I, I go back and forth. I'm like, I mean, sh should you publish a, a broad range of opinions, even if some of them are garbage? Like, I, I mean, I guess so. But anyway, I just wanted to roast that guy uh, because I thought it was a terrible take. And I think it's really indicative of what the kind of neoliberal, like, to me, I was mostly, I was surprised because that's the kind of piece that I would expect to see in like the Atlantic, right? Which I only go to if I want to get like worked up, right? If Unless somebody sends me like a very specific like essay that's about like, Oh, this like, you know, one man who owns a small town cinema in Irving, Illinois, like <laughs> that I want to read. That's like the only thing I want to read from the Atlantic, though. You know what? Most of it's like chin strokey, like neoliberalism. But it, 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 that, I mean, the, Joe, give Joe Biden a break. Like, come on. Yeah, that's it. That's a that's a, that's bread and butter for the Atlantic uh, op-ed department. I just thought that was a bit of a stretch from. Uh, the Zephyr Teachout piece that I just read right before I read the the give Joe Biden a break, which was you know to and Joe Biden is corrupt over here, and then you know uh, Joe Biden is a is an honorable man that we need to you know give our credence to. So anyway, yeah, that was just a, a little bit of a quick uh, slam dunk. But wait, there's more hilarity to ensue because I just couldn't help it. I had to send this piece to you the other day to make sure that you read it because I desperately wanted to cover it on our show because. I couldn't fucking believe my eyes. I just, it was like one of those random moments where I happened to be like on the Vanguard Twitter or whatever. Um, and um, anyway, and like Martin Shkreli just is like trending for some reason. And it's like Pharma Bro is trending. And at that point I'm hooked because if there's like one story that I love to talk shit on, it's Martin Shkreli, one of the biggest fucking douchebag piece of shits. Yeah, he's um, kind of been out of the news for a while too. Since yeah, because he's, he's been in jail. Yeah, yeah, but there was a point like a couple of years ago, like I think when you and I were in high school, when he was like a big like yeah, villain. I think. Yeah, he was like a villain. Like everyone yeah. was like 
fuck this guy. I remember I wrote about him for my high school paper. Nice. And this is a super interesting piece too, because uh, you know, not only does it detail some of his uh, you know, really manipulative abilities, but it also gives you an interesting perspective on how someone who's clearly very, you know, ego driven and on borderline, if not straight up sociopathic, how they really can't expertly manipulate a fellow human being. And, and honestly, guys, check out this piece. Again, it's on L. It's sad. It's really yeah, sad. Yeah, dude. Uh, Just a quick it, overview for anybody who's been living under a rock and hasn't, like, you know, either heard the Reader's Digest version of this piece or checked it out by themselves already. Essentially, what happened is uh, Christine uh, Smith, I believe is how you pronounce her name. Uh, it's spelled a little uh, funny. But essentially, she uh, was a journalist uh, at Bloomberg who was covering the Martin Shkreli case. And she falls in love with this dude while she's covering his insider trading lawsuit. And he is simultaneously one of the most hated men in the world for uh, basically just jacking up the cost of AIDS medication with his company. His company uh, was like this, uh, uh, what's it called? Turing Pharmaceuticals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he basically bought it, jacked, got the patent for AIDS medication, uh, jacked up the price per dose so that basically you had to be Magic Johnson to afford your medication. Um, and, you know, completely just devastated the lives of millions of patients who were requiring this life-saving medication. He was scorned relentlessly across the board, uh, but he's like one of those fucking crazy anarcho-capitalists, right? This is the natural conclusion of anarcho-capitalism in case you needed a million reasons why libertarianism doesn't work, but uh, this is one, Martin Shkreli. Um, yeah, and essentially he, this woman who uh, was a journalist from our hometown of Kansas City, which is interesting to read, uh, she gets this job at Bloomberg News, which is a very high-paced, stressful job. Did you read the part where they said that they like track how many seconds ahead of the competition the reporters are from? Yeah, uh, that shit was weird. Yeah, fucking crazy. Like, damn, that's the like Bloomberg are insane. But um, anyway, it, 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 he she ends up like kind of like she leaves her like. A husband and her, their dog behind you know she's like this like attractive young, like woman like perfectly successful like had so many things going for her and just leaves it all behind and what's devastating is that she's like stands by him and if you read the fucking quote he gave to l magazine it's like i wish her the best of luck in, in future endeavors like he doesn't give a fuck about her dog and she's like writing the state being like i want to let him live with me and finish out his sentence in my uh you know, Harlem apartment and, and, uh, you know, I don't deserve to be away from the man I love and he doesn't deserve to be risking his life and like fucking prison. It's like, yeah. if anybody deserves to be in prison right now, it's fucking Martin Screlly, that scum fucking piece of shit. Yeah. It's such a piece of garbage. And it's, it's just like, I guess this story is really, um, it really showed me something that I didn't realize, which is just how, I mean, I guess I did realize it, but like not to this extent, it's like, Love is so fucking powerful, man. Because if I mean, clearly she didn't go into the situation like trying to get something out of it. It's not like she wants to be with this guy for his money or something. She just was literally reporting on him, and she genuinely fell in love with him, like straight up, which is crazy. Do you think it was me. genuine love, or do you think this guy manipulated her? Like she says well, that the I first think, time, I think, it's it's like she, That's I think to some extent way. you can manipulate someone into being in love with you. I guess, and I, if you obviously when you're that powerful and rich, it's easier, but. Like, I mean, clearly she had some, she has a very emotional connection to this guy. Again, she heard, she, -Tang. she heard the Wu-Tang. She heard that Wu-Tang. Yeah, bro. I mean, that would be the one thing that could potentially come out of this that would be positive is if we uh, get that Wu-Tang record ever trying to hear that shit. But yeah, it's just like, damn, like, I, I, I don't think this woman is a bad person or anything. I don't think she's necessarily even like, I, I mean, obviously you'd have to know her in person, but it's like, how do you fall for this motherfucker? Like, I don't know, dude, it's crazy. Uh, and it's also, like I said, sad, like you said, uh, this guy clearly doesn't really give a shit about her. There's another point where he basically, uh, you know, she says that she wants to be with him and, and, and he says like, well, it's, he, he has a very fatalistic view where it's like, it's never going to work out. It's like, obviously when he gets out of jail, he's not going to, he's not going to, you know, want to be with you. Like he has, no, he's gonna, he seems like the kind of guy that like always is with hookers. I don't know. I yeah. get a really bad vibe from this guy. Like, like he's just one of those, like, you know, wall street, like always at a strip club, like fucking, Oh you know, yeah, he reminds I me. Like, of, I remember I watched. And this is a really aside. And bro, he yeah. reminds me of. He reminds me of Ryan from The Office. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. One time he was doing this Vice interview with a like a reporter, and he's like, in, like invites her to play chess with him, and she's like, all right, whatever, like I'll play chess with you. And then he like starts being like a complete douchebag. He's like, I think you're evoking like this and this kind of defense strategy. Is that the case? And she's like, I literally just tried to play chess with you because you said let's play chess. Like I don't fucking play chess. And like just like gives it right back. To, I'm like, yeah, that's like. Mm. 
Yeah, dude, fuck that guy. And, and also, it's not just that he jacked up that uh, you know medication price, which is why he was such a villain. It's also just that he's a fucking piece of shit yeah, to yeah. everyone. Like yeah, he's an true. asshole to reporters, to people. It, like he's just he's just known for being a fucking scumbag, like smirking little privileged bitch. So like, fuck that guy. I'm I'm glad he didn't. Uh, if it, like again, obviously we talk shit on the fucking incarceration system in this country all the time. But if there is anyone that deserves to be in jail, it's these fucking crooks. It's these fucking guys. So like, I don't give a shit about this motherfucker. No, no. And he was like fucking talking shit. Like, oh, what am I gonna go do? Play Xbox for two years? Like, yeah. like fuck you. I hope you rot. Like you fucking piece of shit. Anyway. Yeah. Um, exactly. So yeah, that, that's a funny story, guys. Go check it out. It's not just funny; it's sad and funny. But check out that piece on L, the journalist and the farmer bro. It's really a good read. It's almost like it almost reads like a short story or something. You can really get engaged in this piece, uh, and it's just an insight again into the human condition. I think more than anything, it's powerful, bro. Like I could never imagine falling uh, for someone like that, but it, it is clearly it does happen. And I mean, this woman clearly has you know, justified everything that Martin has done and everything that he, she clearly has fallen for him and been manipulated. And it's just, it's really sad and unfortunate. And again, um, check that piece out guys. If you haven't, it's worth, it's worth checking out. Uh, one other thing we wanted to talk about was Gavin Newsom replacing Kamala Harris. We were talking about this recently on the show and obviously you and I were hoping that governor Newsom of California would replace either Ro Khanna or Barbara Lee, or maybe Karen Bass is like a distant third but that did not happen. Yeah, and I was I was interested to get um, you know Christine's perspective on that also because I mean it just does leave this uh, you know um, essentially that I mean there's no black women in the Senate right um, there's uh, you know that's I mean that's a lack of representation that I think you know is I, that should be accounted for because it's representative of the fact that if out of a hundred people there are you know nobody there's nobody that you know would look like you in Congress. I think that matters, you know, and, yeah. and not that that's everything. And, uh, but we should also talk about the fact that Alex uh, Padilla is just kind of like a crony of Gavin Newsom, a loyalist for his whole career. Um, you know, never really accomplished uh, a ton as secretary of state, uh, obviously, you know, very friendly to uh, Silicon Valley, uh, all, the, the kind of down the line textbook neoliberal that you would expect. Um, yeah, it's just super disappointing. And and again, like uh, we talked about all these great optimistic scenarios where Gavin Newsom maybe would put his political ambitions, you know, ahead and 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 try to win favor with the progressive left by appointing someone like Kana or Lee to the seat. Uh, but as you know, as we kind of, or at least as you predicted, uh, this wasn't ever going to happen. You know, don't think that these people are going to be your friends when they're not. There's no reason why Gavin Newsom, in retrospect at least, was going to ever appoint an actual progressive to this seat. Of course, he's going to give it to some fucking corrupt loyalist, the Secretary of State, um, Alex Padilla. So, yeah, this is just super disappointing. Alex Padilla is probably not going to really uh, do much in the Senate. He's not really going to, you know, fight for anything. Or, down the line, blue dog. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, obviously Barbara Lee has, um, you know, really won the favor of the left. She voted no against Afghanistan when no one else did. And Ro Khanna obviously was the co-chair of Bernie Sanders campaign and has just been in favor of so many of the right issues. He's been the champion of so many great ideas. So I was really hoping to get a real progressive in the Senate. That's not Bernie Sanders or Ed Markey. And unfortunately today is not the day. However, as uh, Christine Olivo, who we were just talking to did say, you know, we must uh, battle that we have to, you know, as Mitch McConnell said, fill that motherfucking seat. We got to do it. We have to challenge this guy. Uh, we should, you know, launch a campaign. I'm hoping that the People's Party gets involved. Uh, there's no reason that just because Gavin fucking Newsom decided that this dude is going to be the senator, that he has to stay the senator. We should make him a, a two-year senator and get an actual progressive in there, someone that actually wants to serve the people. Again, not that this guy is like some fucking fascist or whatever, but he's definitely not. Uh, he's you know, not what we I, need. He's not what yeah. the people deserve. Yeah, so. especially in the Senate where there's only 100 people. You know, exactly. we need an actual fighter. 100%. Um, that was all of the news that I had, uh, for today. I didn't know if there was anything else specifically that you wanted to get you, Gavin. Um, but other than that, if anybody enjoyed the conversation and you want to hear some more, like we said, we just talked to Christina Olivo. It was a great chat. Uh, check that out and you'll hear more from us, uh, probably after Christmas. Yeah. And again, special thanks to the patrons. Again, you can, uh, hit up that link in the description and, you know, become a, a patron of our channel, support a small independent leftist community we're talking to a lot of people in the vanguard of leftist politics so 
it's in your best interest to subscribe. Keep up with the times, guys. And thanks for tuning in. Thanks for hanging out. We really enjoy it. And we'll be back in the next couple of days. Yeah. See you guys.